Sure, about 10 years ago, uh, Faith Therapeutics began to look at iPSCs as a way to um, create new ways of uh, strategies in regenerative medicine. So with the founders such as Rudolf Janisch, who's one of the pioneers of induced pluripotent stem cell technology, we started thinking about how we're going to bring this really cool technology into uh, the field of regenerative medicine. Around 2012, uh, really the CAR T field took off and we saw a really nice synergy with the adoptive cell therapy that is kind of going forward, combining that with iPSCs to make uh, off-the-shelf products. And that's when we started having conversations with the pioneer of adoptive uh, CAR-19 therapy, which is Michelle Satterline, and then kind of led us down this path. So the presentation really highlights the ability to make an off-the-shelf CAR-T product from a master cell bank. So traditionally, autologous uh, strategies start with the patient's material, patient cells, that are selected for T cells and engineered. Now that's a great start, but cancer patients' T cells are already exhausted, they're impaired. And this process is actually very long and has a lot of steps that are challenging. And so basically what we wanted to do was how can we overcome these challenges by creating a master cell line that can basically produce the same material time and time for a large number of patients. So for autologous CAR T therapy, it works. Patients are really benefiting, those with B-cell lymphoma and leukemia are really benefiting from this uh, really novel, remarkably amazing product. But to, to go from the patient back to the patient with the new modified product, you really have to go through these series of steps. One thing we're starting to hear about is that the apheresis, it's just the starting material is challenging because a lot of people are now trying to uh, get this process going. So, the transplant folks and the CAR-T folks, they're all trying to you know, find their way into these sites, these, uh, these processing sites. And so just, just to get the material is challenging. But when you get the material, then you got to ship it off to the process center. The process center will do its thing, will hopefully uh, you know, be able to take these T cells, culture them, because you have to culture, you have to engineer. And they're able to basically go through this you know, really long process of making the product and then sending it back. You know, and then you start hearing stories about, oh, you know, the product was made, but unfortunately the patient passed away because they didn't have this duration. Or you start hearing things about that the cost, because the process is, is very expensive, the cost is kind of getting in the way with, for patient accessibility. And also uh, the whole process usually produces one dose. So now say it really works well, but you need a second dose. You gotta go through this whole process again. So, so really, the variability that comes into this process, because each patient is different, each, each T cell is different, the cost, the logistics, it really it makes it challenging to make this into a broad um, application. Eventually, you want it to be like aspirin, where you take one every four hours until your headache goes away, or in this case, until your cancer goes away. That's the ultimate uh, dream, and, and that's what we're trying to address, because we're. We're not, we're not reinventing CAR-T. We're just creating a platform, a cellular platform, where you can now have it off the shelf, accessible to every patient at a cost that's affordable. And you can also do multi-dosing. So I really try to address all those challenges that may slow down this remarkable discovery from being implemented to the entire cancer community. So iPSCs are very interesting cell type. You, really, it's, it's amazing to think about what they are. They're cells that are kept in a petri dish, and at any point you can differentiate into any cell type. And you know, sometimes you take it for granted when you're working with them, but it's a petri dish of, of an embryonic-like cell, and after three weeks you have a hepatocyte, or you have a blood cell. So they have this amazing ability to continuously maintain their embryonic-like status, but at the time of differentiation, they could become the cell type based on your protocol, based on your um, interest of, uh, of differentiation. So they also give you this ability to engineer them at the single cell level. Because of our technology, we can take a single iPSC, put in all the attributes we want, and then because they can self-renew in an unlimited manner, expand them in a petri dish. Most primary cells get exhausted. You can't start a T cell from a single cell and expand it into one E11. By that time, the cell is exhausted and you don't have an efficacious product. 
We overcome that by just taking the IPSC that's been engineered at the single cell level and expand it into this large bank of IPSCs. Then we'll take a vial from there. Then we'll differentiate into T cells. So really, we don't make T cells until the final few weeks. And, and so we don't have an exhausted cell. We, we leverage the ability to go from an edited IPSC to an edited CD34 to an edited T cell. So even though our process is 40 days, for example, during the expansion differentiation, we really don't work with T cells towards the end. But once we have the T cells, the product is pure and is the same product every time we do this. And so you end up with this almost unlimited bank of cells that you can tap into every time you start from the IPSC. So dosing, uh, the number of doses we make depends on the dosing of the patient. So there are many dose es escalations that we will conduct during the initial clinical trials. And so our expectation is that the dose will be somewhere between 1E6 to 1E9 cells per patient. If, you, if, if that is going to be, which I believe will be the case, then per each run we make about 1E11, 1E12 cells with our current manufacturing process. So those are hundreds to thousands of doses that you have now per a 40-day process. Now, the beauty of this process is that you're not limited by this number of cells. You're limited by the vessel. So if you end up being able to uh, create larger volume, then you can make more cells. So, you know, when we think about CHO cells that are used to make monoclonal antibodies, they get dumped into 15,000 liter bioreactors. If you're able to get there eventually, then you can almost imagine we're making 1E13 cells. And if you're making 1E13 cells, then, then you're in a good place because I think you're not going to run out. Just that one vial is going to give you enough cells for, for years to come. But say it runs out, you still go back to the same starting material, same process, and make those doses again. So it's quite remarkable in, in terms of when you do the math, a process like that ends up getting divided by the thousands of doses and it ends up being magnitudes less than the current $500,000 ticket or tag price. So I think it's going to be, I don't want to give a number because we haven't done this, but it will be significantly less. And I don't mean we go from 500 to 50, I think you go one more click less. So it's going to be, uh, it will be possible to, to pretend this aspirin and take it once a month until the cancer goes. I think the cost, the, the economics going to make that possible. The availability of the cells and the economics of the price should make multi-dosing feasible. And I think you're going to need that for cancer. I think as cancer evolves, you have to continuously come in with fresh cells to attack it, just like how your body on a daily basis makes NK and T cells to kind of regulate all the transformations that's occurring in your body. I think you have to come in with a renewable source as well. Yeah, so that's a great question. I think uh, our first product is an NK cell. So we are making NK cells today for adoptive uh, cell therapy, adoptive cancer immunotherapy, and that's in the IND phase. So we hope that by the end of the year, we are treating patients with NK cells. I feel that the T cells are just one year behind. So in the same place where the NK cells were last year and we're now in the IND stage, I think the T cells will next year be at, at the IND stage as well. And so we hope that by end of next year, we're dosing patients. And, you know, and it's hard to predict some of these things, but working with MSKCC and their breadth of knowledge when it comes to CAR T therapy and GMP manufacturing, you gain a little more confidence that you might actually be able to achieve this goal. No, I think, uh, I think CAR, autologous CAR T works really well. I don't want to suggest it doesn't. I think it's just, it needs to evolve into a process where now it could be amenable to everybody and not just select people who are close to a certain hospital. Um, and costs should, uh, should not get in the way of treatment. So we hope that we could take this remarkable discovery that several pioneers have brought uh, to the clinic and just make it more amenable to the general audience, the general cancer patients.